Crises and War. Here you can see Gavrilo Princip, the Serbian nationalist student assassinating the Archduke Ferdinand and his wife. Although they were both wearing bulletproof vests, they died. There was support in Serbia for Serbians living in Vojvodina in the, and in Bosnia in the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so there was irredentist pressure that they be given freedom. Ned Lebeau proposed a classification of four distinct types of crises. Justification of hostilities crises, spin-off crises, brinkmanship crises, and accidental crises, or unintended escalation crises. These are in some respects similar to MIDs, and there's a significant overlap. What's interesting here, though, is that we have a qualitative distinction of the dynamics of each of these, something which the MIDs data set does not have. So if one could apply these to the MID data set and run a statistical test, it would be fascinating what the result would be. The first type of crisis is the justification of hostility crisis. Normally, if a crisis leads to war, it is because of psychological and cognitive biases during the crisis. But in a justification of hostility crisis, decision-making for war occurs prior to the crisis. So it's not really a crisis at all. The crisis provides the casus belli for the aggressor. In other words, the justification of war. Because you need to justify the war not only to your domestic population to activate them, usually through the rally around the flag effect, but also you need to justify the war to the third parties so that they don't intervene against you, so they don't create a counter coalition. The purpose of this crisis is to mobilize domestic and international support for war by making the other look like the aggressor or the illegitimate actor, and thereby making the opponent lose their basis, basis of support. The problem is that you lose the element of surprise by having this kind of preliminary crisis. There was a claim of a sea battle on October 6, 1973. So in the outbreak of hostilities on October 1973, when the U.S. asked Egypt why they had attacked Israel, Kissinger, the American National Security Advisor, was told that Israel had attacked with naval craft. Kissinger thereafter called the Israelis and sought confirmation, which of course the Israelis denied. The Germans in World War II claimed that the triggering event for the invasion of Poland was that on, on September 1st, 1939, a Polish army unit attacked a Gliwitz radio station inside Germany. Although very few believed the veracity of the episode, after the war it was revealed that the attacking Poles were actually disguised German troops. On September 18th to 19th, 1931, Chinese saboteurs dynamited a railroad bridge in Manchuria. This came to be called the Manchuria Bridge Incident. The Japanese, who were stationed in cantonments in the region to protect commercial interests from the Russians, such as railroads and factories, retaliated by invading Manchuria and ultimately China. And this led to a series of events, including the U.S. oil embargo in 1949, uh, 1941, and subsequently the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. After the war, it was discovered that the Japanese staged the sabotage and had themselves blown up the bridge. But this was suspected by most journalists and analysts at the time. The Gulf of Tonkin Incident. In August of 1964, the U.S. Navy was deployed off the coast of North Vietnam to support South Vietnamese commando operations against North Vietnamese targets. On August 2nd, three North Vietnamese torpedo boats unsuccessfully attacked the U.S. Navy ship Madox. On August 4th, a similar attack was reported, and the outrage in the U.S. in response to the second attack led American President Johnson to request from the U.S. Congress to empower him to prosecute a war against Vietnam. On August 7th, 
the Gulf of Tonkin resolution passed the Senate 88 to 2 votes, and the House of Representatives 416 to 0. And the U.S. began deploying its army units to South Vietnam. In fact, the second attack, the one that triggered the outrage, never occurred and was the result of a misreading of censors, which the Navy ship captains have since admitted. But President Johnson compelled the Pentagon to suppress this fact. This is all the more surprising since the vote to go to war in the Tonkin Gulf incident was stronger than the vote to go to war after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So there's a five-step formula to exploit a provocation to arouse public opinion. And the, and the key is to look like you're reacting and you don't have the initiative and you're the victim of the action of others. For example, you want to make it look like you're being the target of fortuitous events. On January 1965, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong were pressing their attacks against South Vietnamese positions with some success. The U.S. needed an excuse to begin intensive bombing of military targets in North Vietnam. On February 7, 1965, at a highland town called Play Cu in Vietnam, a Viet Cong attacked a U.S. training base, killing nine and wounding 100 Americans. This justified the beginning of heavy U.S. bombing in Vietnam in Operations Flaming Dart and Operations Rolling Thunder. McGeorge Bundy, Johnson's national security advisor, had stated after the fact that, quote, play coups are streetcars, close quote. By this he meant that if the U.S. government needed an excuse to bomb North Vietnam, they would not have to wait long before an incident were to arrive, much like a streetcar. Step two is to make unacceptable demands. For example, the message to the North Vietnamese by the U.S. government was, leave South Vietnam. Number three, legitimize demands with international principles. Well, North Vietnamese troops had attacked U.S. troops in South Vietnam, and this was seen as illegitimate. Step four, deny or understate your actual objectives. So the U.S. wants North Vietnam to leave South Vietnam. In fact, the U.S. was looking for an excuse to bomb North Vietnam, but they couldn't admit it. Number five, employ rejection of your demands as a casus belli. So you want to maneuver the opponent so they refuse you, and then when they refuse you, you can act. So in 1991, the U.S. threat to bomb Saddam Hussein was in the form of a letter that U.S. Secretary of State James Baker gave to Iraqi Secretary of State Tariq Aziz. And it was a letter to leave Iraq. And the Iraqis couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly be seen to be submitting to American threats. And so the Iraqis refused. And this ultimately gave the U.S. the influence it needed in the United Nations to begin operations against Iraq. The 2003 U.S. threat to Iraq to completely denuclearize and to cut its relations with Al-Qaeda and to open up its economy to and its, its, uh, its state to complete observation obviously met with a refusal by Saddam Hussein. Not because Saddam Hussein was helping Al-Qaeda, he was not, nor because Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons, which he did not, but because he didn't want the U.S. to find their way into Iraq. His refusal led to the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. An alternate approach is not to declare war oneself, but to get the other to declare war on you. So domestic and international opinion can then be more easily mobilized, but this is very difficult to do. It can evolve from an attempt over uh, accommodation or start out as a justification of hostilities crises. This here is Napoleon III, a leader of France. Now, starting a war by getting the other side to start the war is best exemplified by the beginning of the Franco-Prussian War 
In July 15, 1870, Bismarck was in the process of rallying the German principalities into the single state of Germany, as well as provoking French hostility by attempting to place a German prince in Spain. Bismarck believed he had a better military, and since he also needed international support, he didn't need the uh, English uh, or the Italians or other great powers from intervening, he hoped the threatened unification of Germany would provoke the French sufficiently to attack first, so that he would not have to attack. Now, there was an exchange of views that were public, and there was a telegram called the Ems Telegram, which was falsified and ultimately published in newspaper that was an outrageous attack on uh, the reputation of France and of Napoleon III's political position. And so Napoleon III, the leader of France, felt compelled for domestic reasons to declare war on Germany. Germany and Prussia were much better organized militarily, and after the defeat of the French army at Sedan and the Prussian siege of Paris, Paris surrendered. France was defeated and Alsace-Lorraine was incorporated into a newly unified Germany and the conditions were set for the First World War. The second type of crisis is a brinkmanship crisis. This is an attempt to undermine the commitment of one adversary to a value, and it's marked by the initiator's unwillingness to initiate war. It has three non-exclusive and non-static goals. The first is obtain benefits. Number two, it may also seek a trade-off in which a concession is sought elsewhere. U.S. President Reagan placed cruise missiles and Pershing nuclear missiles in NATO territory in the 1980s, specifically Sicily, Belgium, Holland, and Germany, in order to pressure the Soviet Union into negotiating an arms control agreement that saw the U.S. missiles and the SS-20s, which are depicted in the picture, uh, to ultimately be withdrawn. Number three, the purpose may also be to undermine a state's credibility through humiliation. Cuba in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, was in part a humiliation of the Soviet Union because the U.S. wanted to set limits as to what they would permit the Soviet Union to do in terms of the export and deployment of nuclear missiles outside of their own territory. It had a huge effect on the domestic life of Khrushchev. He was shortly thereafter pushed out and replaced by Leonid Brezhnev, the new Soviet leader. In 1898, we have the incidents of the Fashoda incident, which you can see in the map as a town on the Nile in the southern uh, Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. The French wanted control over Sudan during the British invasion of the Upper Nile so that they could link up with Madagascar, while the British wanted to link Kenya with Egypt. French and British armies confronted each other at Fashoda. After British General Kitchener threatened to attack, the French General Marchand was ordered to withdraw by the French Foreign Minister de Calcé. Although French demanded retaliation, oddly enough, the crisis brought France and Britain into an alliance in 1904, the Entente Cordiale. Now, in terms of a local history, there's a road in Notre Dame de Grasse in Montreal called Girouard. Girouard was the French Canadian engineer who led a company of French Canadians that built the railway for the English along the Nile from Cairo all the way through the Sudan. Another example is the Berlin crisis of 1948. Joseph Stalin, the Soviet leader, wanted to pressure the British, French, and Americans to give up control of West Berlin. So Stalin had the Soviet army blockade the road access to the city. The Allies, however, ensured supplies to the city through a massive airlift until eventually the Soviets backed down. Now, withdrawing from a commitment has reputational and domestic costs. These are called audience costs. There are two conditions for a brinkmanship crisis. First, the existence of serious domestic and or international threats that a successful challenge of an adversary's commitment promises to overcome. It increases the risk propensity. Two, 
the perception by the initiator's policymakers that the adversary in question is likely to back away from his commitment when challenged. And this limits the extent of a risk. Now, threats that lead to brinkmanship crises are, one, negative shifts in the distribution of power. And this is what happened with the French versus the Russians in 1870. Two, weakness in the initiator's political system. This is the diversionary hypothesis for war. Idi Amin, the president of Uganda, had in the 1970s in threatened to invade Florida as a threat to the U.S. Number three, intra-elite competition for power. There was actually, as we're going to see, a competition between the branches of the Argentinian military that ultimately led to the attack on the Falkland Islands. Number four, states can pursue aggressive policies for idiosyncratic reasons that are not linked to the need of the state. This again is Idi Amin threatening to invade Florida. Now we can take a game theoretic perspective of the brinkmanship crisis. It's basically a chicken game. You've got on the one end uh, John Travolta driving into um, Henry Winkler on a road, and you're familiar with the chicken game from the uh, from the um, uh, games theory uh, lecture. So in its strategic form game, we have a chicken. You've got player A and player B. They each have a strategy of cooperation and affection, and they they're all trying to be a hero. But to be a hero, they have to risk death. So chicken games are characterized by fears of a common aversion, a common fear among both characters. Now, in our application here in the course, it's about war. Now, neither side wants war, but the side that appears less willing to risk war will be exploited by the other side that is more willing to risk war. Now, there is war, which entails costs, and then there's nuclear war, which is almost always seen as inflicting costs so great they can't possibly justify uh, the political obje objective unless that objective is just survival. An example of a brinkmanship crisis is the Munich crisis that occurred between Nazi Germany and the Western democracies in the lead up to the Second World War. After Adolf Hitler came to power and Germany was in the later stages of rearmament, there arose more and more disputes between it and the opposing democracies. Adolf Hitler came to power in March of 1933. Germany began its rearmament in 1935 and the democracies didn't intervene. Germany then occupied the Rhineland, which is the part of Germany that's to the west of the Rhine and borders uh, France and the um, uh, Holland and Belgium on March 7th, 1936. On March 12th, 1938, Germany occupied Austria in the Anschluss. Again, there was no significant reaction. In fact, the only country that opposed the move was fascist Italy under Mussolini, and they were ineffectual. So the Munich crisis erupted in September and October of 1938 over Germany's threat of war over Czechoslovakia. The specific German claim was that there were 2.8 million Germans, Sudeten Germans, who lived in the Sudetenland, and that Germany wanted the same principles and rights as were asserted by the other countries in Europe, which is the right of self-determination, that people have a right to choose their own leader. The problem was for Czechoslovakia was that the Sudetenland, where the Sudeten Germans lived, were mountainous and were the location of most of Czechoslovakia's defenses. So negotiations occurred between Adolf Hitler and Neville Chamberlain from the 15th to the 20th September 1938. Hitler wanted to be permitted to take over the Sudetenland and the democracies didn't want that to happen. 
because once the Sudetenland was taken, Czechoslovakia would then be easily occupied by the Nazis. But neither the French or the English domestically had populations that wanted war. The English population was still very pacifist because of their experience of the consequences of the First World War. So ultimately, a decision was made, an agreement come to. On September 29th, an agreement, the Munich Agreement, in which England, France, and Italy permitted Germany to dismember Czechoslovakia and to take over the Sudetenland. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain then flew back to England and he declared, coming off the airplane to the press, that I brought peace in our time. And he essentially offered a deal to appease Hitler, thinking that Hitler could be satisfied. But within a year and a half, the Second World War had broken out and Winston Churchill had replaced Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain was not a stupid man. Uh, his family had been involved in politics earlier and it was a family of businessmen from the 19th century, the Pax Britannica. The British had amassed an enormous empire and enormous wealth and the British did this by being very careful not to be enthusiastically getting involved in wars. They built a minimum army and a cost-effective fleet and for nearly a century they were the wealthiest empire in the world. So Neville Chamberlain came from a world of businessmen seeking peace to enable commerce and he thought if he could only delay Hitler from going to war eventually domestic processes and the threats of the costs of war would restore peace. And appeasement had worked many times before. So Germany, having occupied the Rhineland and Austria and the Anschluss, then took over the Sudetenland. And then ultimately, it took over all of Czechoslovakia. So the Munich Agreement has become a symbol for what not to do when negotiating with military expansionists, appeasement. France and England were unprepared for war, as was Germany. But there was still a genuine belief among the Allies that if you gave in to what Hitler demanded as his, he would then normalize the relationship. The French and English were not prepared for the fact that Hitler was insatiable and that he had an underlying plan to proceed to war no matter what. His goal was war. An archetype of weakness since Hitler is typically characterized as appeasement. However, appeasement is not always wrong. The US was appeased by the British at the end of the 19th century in order that the Americans became helpful to the English in the British confrontation with Germany. It led to peace between the English and the Americans and compromise and ultimately was a key factor in British victories in both the First and the Second World Wars. Truman's intervention in Korea in 1950 and Johnson's intervention in Vietnam in 1965 and Bush's rapid involvement in Kuwait in 1990 all stemmed from the US political memory of the Munich failure in Europe. The second type of crisis is the spin-off crisis. These are crises that are secondary outgrowths of ongoing wars that affect third parties. This here is the Zimmerman telegram. It's the document that led to the US declaration of war against Germany in World War I. So German U-boats were deployed between 1915 and 1917. And this is often called the U-boat crisis because of the number of British, but also neutral ships that were being sunk. During the First World War, the Germans were seeking to isolate Great Britain from its empire. The British had to import their food and their fuel by sinking merchant vessels carrying these resources. However, the submarines were sinking many neutral non-British ships by accident, particularly US ships. Gradually, particularly after the 
publicized sinking of the Lusitania, a passenger liner with Americans on board, U.S. public opinion drifted against Germany. When a decoded German diplomatic message, the Zimmermann telegram, was intercepted, announcing an unlimited submarine campaign against the British and neutral shipping in the Atlantic, this led the U.S. to declare war against Germany on April 6, 1917. The U.S. was also upset that the Germans had promised buy a California to Japan and had urged Mexico to invade the U.S., promising Mexico a return of the territory that the U.S. had seized from Mexico in the Mexican-American War of 1846. Now, factors that affect the incidence of spin-off crises are as follows. One, geographic proximity. Closer states tend to have a greater interest and stake in what's happening. U.S. commerce traveled in the same area as British shipping, and it therefore became subject to German blockade plans, sometimes deliberately, sometimes inadvertently. Two, the longer and more stalemated a crisis, the greater the likelihood of spin-off crises because states adopt more desperate measures. The German adoption of unlimited submarine warfare in 1917 was a desperate attempt to end the First World War, which had already dragged on for three, four years. There was a known risk that the U.S. would be provoked into a war with Germany, but the Germans were desperate enough to take that risk. Arab-Israeli disputes gradually involved the superpowers, and the same happened between India-Pakistan, Iran-Iraq, and Ethiopia and Somalia. The third factor is spin-off crises are more likely to occur as the military position within a state increases in influence because they are more likely to escalate to include all the military options. Militaries want to use all of the available resources. Factor four, public attitudes in the primary and the third parties may make spin-off crises more likely or harder to resolve. Those are called audience costs. You have populations demanding of their politicians that they take tough stances on certain policies. Factor five, a primary party may try and provoke a conflict between a secondary and tertiary party. We have the example of the Levon affair in 1954. The British were leaving the Suez Canal in Egypt as a part of an agreement with Egypt. And this would have removed England as a military obstacle to Egyptian moves into the Sinai and against Israel. So the Israeli military intelligence, without permission of the Israeli prime minister, blew up hotels and cultural sites in Egypt. The intention was to provoke the British to blame the Egyptians and to return their military to the Suez Canal Zone. However, the Egyptians caught the Israeli operatives and it turned into a huge scandal that led to the resignation of Levon in the Israeli government. Now, spin-off crises unfold in two ways. One, belligerents make unacceptable demands on third parties. The Iraqis, for example, were sinking oil tankers in the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq war in order to provoke a naval intervention by the international community against Iran. It worked. The US, the UK, France, and the Soviet Union, as well as other European states, deployed a navy that was then severely used against the Iranian navy and ultimately led to attacks on the Iranian navy by the US navy. Two, crisis situations arise that adversely affect the interests of the third party that in turn make demands on the crisis initiators. And we have again here the US and the example of the German U-boat deployment of 1917. In all cases, the decision makers were willing to go to war to protect their interests. The fourth type of crisis for LeBeau is the accidental crisis, which he defines as whose defining characteristic is the perception by central decision makers that the provocation triggering the crisis was both undesired and unsanctioned 
by the central decision makers of the adversary. So we have our first example, which is the 1904-1905 Dogger Bank incident. Dogger Bank is the blue dot that you see between Norway and England in the upper left on the map. So while preparing to the, attack the Japanese at Tsushima, the Russian fleet proceeded from St. Petersburg, if you can see at the beginning on the left of the red line, around the world. And they became alarmed by rumors of a Japanese torpedo fleet in the North Sea of Europe. And this was because the English and the Japanese were allied. On October 21st, 1904, the Russian fleet encountered and engaged a fleet of Japanese torpedo boats and began shelling. It sank one and damaged two before the ships could fire back. Now, it was not until a week later, when the Russian fleet reached Spain, that they realized what had happened. On October 21st, 1904, the Russian fleet of some 42 ships, including seven battleships, encountered and sank one ship of a British fishing trawler fleet, killing two fishermen. And the Russians realized the mistake they had made, because the British Navy, which was much larger, was shadowing the Russian fleet. On October 28th, the British Navy mobilized a force of 28 battleships, and set sail after the Russian fleet. The British agreed to spare the fleet when the Russians submitted to an international tribunal and key Russian officers were detained. Now the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Lansdowne, believed the incident was the result of the Russian propensity to fire first and ask questions later, a result of a lack of discipline. But his desire for detente with the Russians restrained British retaliation. To have a war with the Russians would have meant having to deal with the Russians in Iran, where the British and the Russians had come to some sort of agreed division, and a fight in Afghanistan. So there were serious repercussions that would escalate if the British actually fought the Russian fleet. There are other examples. Number one, the destruction of the U.S. battleship Maine in Cuba's harbor in February 1898 that led to the U.S.-Spanish War. A uh, U.S. ship exploded in Havana Harbor, the Americans blamed Spain, and it led to a declaration of war, and the Americans attacked the Spanish in Cuba. Number two, the sinking of a U.S. gunboat by Japanese aircraft on the Yangtze River in China in December 1937. And that was a close call, because the Americans especially in the military, wanted to retaliate. Japan, of course, did not want to face a war with the US this early. Number three, the sinking of a French Channel steamer that resulted in the deaths of American passengers by a German submarine of March of 1916. And this is another close call, which outraged Americans, but didn't lead to a declaration of war. The Corfu incident, in which mines placed by Albanian communists in the Corfu Channel between Italy and Albania in October 1946, damaged two British ships, the Samarez and the Volage, and almost led to British military operations against Albania. Number five, the destruction of a Libyan airliner over the Sinai in 1972, shot down by the Israelis because it was going very close to the Israeli nuclear weapons assembly site at Beersheba, at Damona. Here you can see islands associated with the uh, ever so often territorial disputes between Greece and Turkey. So we're going to apply the idea of an accidental or unintended war to the process of escalation to the Arab-Israeli 1967 war. The 1967 Arab-Israeli war was unplanned from the perspective of all of the participants. Now you can see here the Israelis, the Syrians, the Jordanians, and the Egyptians. And soldiers were also sent from Saudi Arabia and Iraq. And you can see Israel has approximately 264,000 men, 800 tanks, and 400 aircraft, and is outnumbered by its immediate neighbors. Now, the Israelis, the Egyptians, the Syrians, or the Jordanians, none of them could foresee that this war was going to happen. Here you can see Nasser, the Egyptian leader. The 1967 war was not a preemptive war, as the Israelis frequently argue in order to justify their initiation of the attack. 
the Egyptians were never about to attack Israel. There are a number of books written by scholars from Israel that make the claim, but in all of those books, they never cite government sources from the Arabs. Prior to the conflict, Egyptian President Nasser had even indicated that the conditions for an Egyptian attack were superior force, the political as well as blockaded isolation of Israel, Arab unity, and none of these prevailed immediately before the crisis. On November 13, 1966, the Israelis raided the Jordanian village of Al Samu, but Nasser chose not to act. Following a February 1966 coup, a revolutionary Ba'athist government in Syria stepped up the sponsorship of Al Fatah, which are Palestinians, uh, Palestinian militants, infiltrating against Israeli settlements, particularly farms on the border area. After two incidents, Israel brought the issue to the United Nations, but was blocked by Soviet vetoes. In November 1966, Egypt and Syria agreed to come to each other's aid if a war were to occur with Israel. On April 7, 1967, Syrian guns fired on the Israeli settlements in the demilitarized zone, and the Israelis retaliated with tanks and artillery, shooting down six Syrian aircraft. Nasser did not come to Syria's aid because he believed that Syria was being unnecessarily provocative. On April 17, 1967, Nasser did not come to Syria's aid when the Israelis bombarded Syrian positions in the Golan Heights and shot down another six Syrian aircraft. On May 11th, Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol stated that Israel would attack Syria in retaliation for Fedayeen attacks. These are the militants that are Palestinian that are trying to reclaim their land. Here you can see the Golan Heights in the picture on the bottom right, and you can see Levi Eshkol, the Israeli Prime Minister, in the upper right. On May 12th to 13th, Nasser was convinced by the Soviets that Israel was about to conduct an attack on Syria, which the Israelis denied and invited the Soviet ambassador to visit the Galilee to see for themselves. In fact, Israel had moved some two brigades, 5,000 men each, rather than the 11 to 13 brigades claimed by the Soviet Union and Syrian intelligence. Probably because the Soviets wanted to support a large operation against the Israeli nuclear site. The USSR was basically exaggerating the Israeli military threat to instigate the Arab state to deal with Israel's soon to be operational nuclear weapons program located at Dimona outside Beersheba in the Negev desert. On May 14th, Nasser mobilized the Egyptian army, believing the Soviet claim about Israeli mobilization. The Israeli mobilization, in fact, was never confirmed by the Arab states. Israel detected the mobilization and alerted their own military. On May 15th, the Egyptians began crossing their military into the Sinai, raising the number of soldiers to 100,000 within the week. Nasser had done what he'd done in 1960, which was basically an SOP. And in 1960, the Israelis did not react. They did institute Operation Rotem because the deployment of the Egyptians of the Sinai was very shocking to the Israelis. And so they subsequently developed, de developed a plan to closely supervise the Egyptian deployments. So Nasser didn't expect that this deployment would provoke the Israelis to attack. He was simply showing commitment to defend other Arab states. When on May 15th, the Israelis did not display tanks on their Independence Day parade, the Egyptians assumed that the Israelis were preparing for war. So here's the first indication that the Israelis were not reacting the way that Nasser thought they would. On May 15th, Nasser privately stated that Egypt and Syria could not resist an Israeli attack. Here you can see General Fauzi on the top right, the deployment of the Egyptian army in the Sinai on the bottom right, and Nasser uh, uh, with pilots in the bottom left. On May 16th, Nasser requested the departure of the UN from the Sinai and Sharm el Sheikh. Nasser expected that the UN would delay and refer the request to the Security Council, but Utent, the UN General Secretary, 
to the surprise of the Egyptians and the Israelis, withdrew UN forces immediately. On May 16th, Israeli chiefs of staff alerted the Israeli military units that war was coming. The Israelis watched the Egyptian 4th Armored Division, which was a key unit in the Egyptian army, which had not left its camp near Cairo. And they saw that as indicative of the Egyptians not going to attack. Uh, you can see the UN in the bottom right. You can see Sharm el-Sheikh in the bottom um, left. And you can see um, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, the leader in the top right. He planned the 1967 uh, war and was ultimately sidelined by Moshe Dayan and uh, members of the Haganah because his uh, background uh, was uh, not from uh, that tradition. He was actually uh, from uh, a kibbutzim tradition, so politically a very different um, uh, origin. On May 19th, Israel prepared its navy for war. On May 20th, Israel begins full mobilization of the Israeli army opposite Egypt. This is a problem because with Israeli soldiers in uniform, they have a use it or lose it dilemma. The Israeli economy shudders to a halt. The Israeli can't maintain that mobilization forever. They eventually do have to attack or cancel the mobilization and go back. On May 22nd, the Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol was under domestic pressure to resist the Egyptian move and on May 22nd mobilized the Israeli army. Israel was thereafter faced with a use it, or do, use it dilemma as it could not maintain the cost of keeping its mobilized army in confrontation with Egypt for long. 20% of Egypt's military was in Yemen, providing a unique opportunity for Israel to strike. On May 22nd, Nasser considered sending the Israelis a message that the Strait of Tehran blockade would not be enforced. This is important because Israel got most of its oil from Iran and the Iranians would send shipments of oil through the Red Sea, past the Straits of Tehran to the Israeli port of Eilat next to the coast of the Sinai and to the, uh, to the Jordanian uh, port of Aqaba. But Nasser was afraid that if his communication to the Israelis were leaked to the Egyptian public, uh, it would cause a political backlash. And so he canceled the letter. On May 23rd, Defense Minister Yitzhak Rabin had stated that Israel had to attack because, quote, it's not just freedom of navigation that is hanging in the balance. Israel's credibility, determination, and capacity to exercise her right of self-defense are all being put to the test." Close quotes. On May 23rd, the Israelis spotted the 4th Egyptian Armored Division moving over the bridges of the Suez Canal into the Sinai. That was the key indicator for the Israelis. On May 24th, Egypt closes the Straits of Tehran, so oil tankers from Iran had to turn around. And Israel's economy was heavily dependent on external supplies and could not survive a blockade. On that day, uh, it was believed by uh, Nasser that there was an 80% likelihood of an Israeli attack. Nasser informed UN General Secretary Uthant and the US and the Soviet ambassadors that he would not start a war. On May 24th, French President de Gaulle warned the Israelis not to attack first. So the Israelis, who in the past had relied on France for arms, went instead to try to seek approval from the U.S. to go to war. On May 25th, Secretary of State Dean Rusk told Israel that Egypt was not going to attack, and therefore told Israel, do not attack. You can see here a satellite photo of the Sinai Peninsula, particularly the Gulf of Aqaba. You can see the Israeli city of Alat in the Negev Desert. You can see Sharm el-Sheikh and the Straits of Tehran uh, through which the tankers were uh, being blockaded. On May 26th, after Nasser had observed his army moving into the Sinai, he changed his opinion of the relative military balance between Israel and Egypt and concluded that Egypt could survive an Israeli attack. This happens frequently. I've seen this type of process occur where uh, a rational assessment in a headquarters is overturned when soldiers see a physical display of the military instruments of power. Nasser announces Egypt's long-term goal of the destruction of Israel in public speeches in Egypt. On May 26th, Israelis tell the Americans that Egypt will attack on May 27th, but the U.S. disagrees stating that Egypt is in a defensive posture. 
We know now from Egyptian sources that the Egyptians deployed into the desert in a defensive posture, posture, then shifted to an offensive posture, which was actually not really an offensive posture. It's called the sword and shield deployment. It's a Soviet deployment where you have a strong reserve for a counterattack. And then they shifted back to a forward defense posture. So this is obviously confusing to the Israelis. These were due to the confusion in the Egyptian military command under Marshal Amr, and had actually nothing to do with Nasser's instructions. The U.S. calculated that Israel would win no matter who attacked first. The Pentagon estimated in their war games that if Egypt struck first, the war would last two weeks, and if Israel struck first, it would last one week. The Israelis were concerned about the cost of victory, and there was therefore intense paranoia regarding any threat of Egyptian attack, since an Egyptian first strike would make it difficult to destroy the Egyptian Air Force. Johnson warned the Israelis that if they struck first, they would be on their own. So on May 27th, the Israeli cabinet was divided between the civilians who were worried by a letter sent by US President Johnson to show restraint, and the Israeli military, which had been calling for an attack since May 24th. The military argued that for every day that passed, Egyptian preparations would increase Israeli casualties by 200 people. The vote was deadlocked 7 to 7. On May 28, there was a shakeup within the Israeli cabinet in which more aggressive military elements such as Moshe Dayan took over from Yitzhak Rabin. But the decision for war is delayed until the Israelis can establish the US reaction. The Israelis are fearful of a return to the US's policy of 1956 when the Israelis were pushed out of the Sinai by President Eisenhower. He basically threatened Israel with economic retaliation. Based on the Israeli cabinet changes, Nasser estimated the probability of an Israeli attack at 100% by the beginning of June. On May 28th, Egyptian troops began moving into Jordan by airplane and Iraq announced it would send troops to Jordan, threatening Israel. King Hussein of Jordan signed a defense agreement with Egypt. On June 2nd, Nasser announced that Israel would probably attack between June 3rd to 5th. On June 3rd, 15 of 17 cabinet members voted for war with Egypt after it appeared that the U.S. would not oppose an Israeli victory in the way that the U.S. opposed the victory in 1956. This shows that the key factor was not Israel's military power, it was whether Israel was going to re receive diplomatic support. Because Israel was relatively small. It depended on uh, foreign arms and being able to, to trade with foreign countries. In fact, Israel's oil supply from Iran was guaranteed by the US. So Israel's whole existence depended on uh, 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 U.S. grace. On June 4th, 1967, Israel began its attack. It attacked Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, and it captured territory in Egypt, the Sinai, the West Bank from Jordan, and the Golan from Syria. On June 5th, Israel, Israel's foreign minister, Eba Eban, told the U.S. ambassador that Egypt attacked first, which of course it did not. And this was a a weak attempt at a justification of war uh, claim. So let's do some counterfactual analysis. What is the earliest avoidable provocation? Well, number one, had the Egyptians not closed the Gulf of Aqaba to Israeli shipping, the Israelis would still have had a causes belly to attack Egypt, but probably would not have been as provoked to do so because it wouldn't have affected their economy. Number two, had the Israelis not prepared such a large retaliation against the Syrians, then Egypt would not have deployed its army to the Sinai that led directly to its blockade of the Israeli port of Eilat. So what were the points of no return? Well, one, after Egypt blockaded the Israeli port of Eilat, so there's no oil coming from Iran, there was tremendous pressure in Israel to act. And this pressure was widespread enough that civilian opposition would not prevail. Two, the Egyptian buildup became inevitable after Israel threatened to attack Syria and the Soviets deceptively confirmed the buildup. 
Three, changes in goals. The Israelis went from a simple retaliation to an opportunity to capture extensive land after it appeared there would not be a repeat of the events of 1956 in which the U.S. would restrict Israeli gains. And number two, after Nasser saw the size of his military, he changed his estimate of the relative balance of the Egyptian army versus the Israelis, and he believed he could humiliate Israel into submission, if not attack it at a later date of convenience, if he were just to blockade Israel. Now, according to Sinise and Vasquez, disputes or crises, when they're protracted and unresolved, may produce a curvilinear relationship with war incidents. States may treat these protracted disputes with sort of a ritualized response. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go to war. According to Reed, joint democracy affects the onset of crises, but not the escalation of crises. So if two democracies genuinely dislike each other, and we're going to look at that issue later on, and they generally have a, a profound dispute, they could go to war. But typically, joint liberal democracy limits the outbreak of crises. Most countries simply refer the dispute to lawyers and committees or to their foreign ministries. Democracies are more prone than other regime types to getting locked into escalatory processes because of their audience costs. The leader makes a promise to the population and the leader can be removed through an election. Whereas an authoritarian state, authoritarian leaders can always disregard uh, and are less vulnerable to the opinions of their population, especially if they haven't yet lost a war. 